and welcome to the TDS Talking Early Years podcast. Each week we'll be joined by educational experts from across the globe offering exclusive insights, inspiration and guidance to help practitioners unlock the potential for learning in the early years. Welcome to TTS Talking Early Years with me, Alastair Bryce Clegg, and my guest today is Steph Ainsworth. And we've been talking in these podcast episodes about teacher resilience, but also the culture of the early years workforce and how we can all use resilience to make us not just better at our job, but also make us happier in our lives. But of course, it's not quite that simple, is it, Steph? It's certainly not that simple. Um, so yeah, in the previous episodes, we've talked about how uh, teacher resilience and kind of well-being as a sort of related construct um, operate as a process across ecological systems and what we mean by that is across lots of different aspects of your environment including you as a person within that environment so yeah when we're trying to think how do we make teachers more resilient happier etc um, we need to very much think about them but also the environment they're in um, and I think we we focus so far on kind of the individual and what settings can do, but I think today we're going to talk a little bit about um, what what we can happen in that broader policy context. So things are uh, are even more complex there because that's such a big system that that is operating kind of across the country with lots of different drivers going on um, behind the scenes. It is huge, and I think if you looked especially in terms of early years if you look at how policy has evolved basically if we go back to the good old industrial revolution which is the time that we started bringing children into spaces to teach them and you know, everybody's seen those kind of victorian schools where everybody's lined up in desks there are elements of our current teaching in early years and across the teaching profession that are very different from that often led by technology but there are lots of elements of what we do that are a lot about compliance, so getting children to comply with an expected level of compliance. And I think more than that is where that expectation comes from. So are those expectations that we have in our early years curriculum, are they, and, and government policy, is it linked to child development? Or is it more linked to you know, world rankings or where the government's, you know, government's always trying to put in place let's close this gap, let's improve that. And yes, obviously, we want the best life chances for everybody that we can, but you don't always achieve those by making them or making practitioners try and get 37% more children achieve a certain level in mathematics by the time they're five. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and those things that you talked about there, that kind of key focus on on data, uh, meeting percentages, this sort of standardization, standardized approach to um, education does come a lot when, up a lot when we talk to teachers in our research around well-being because they it makes them feel very conflicted and, and very constrained, as you might imagine. Um, when we did uh, a big survey looking at factors affecting well-being, one of the key, one of the top six that came out as having the most impact was a conflict between beliefs and practice so it's the, which is a kind of little mini scale we made where we were trying to get a sense of um to what extent do teachers feel they're able to teach in a way that aligns with their beliefs sort of yeah. how they think they should yeah. be teaching um so that that kind of policy emphasis on data um from from the teachers perspectives we've been talking to really prevents them from having a child censored pedagogy um and interestingly teachers are sort of saying that across all the age phases we've spoken to but as you can imagine in early years that's even more of a tension because um on the one hand a lot of the documentation is kind of saying you know we want the children to learn from, through play and we want it to be child censored but then when but, you've got kind of yeah. end point of well yeah. they've all got to get here at the same time and yeah. That that can kind of it can leave teachers to feel very conflicted and and very stressed. So I think um, when I ask teachers, you know, what would you like to change at a policy level? Um, some of the key things that come up about having a more kind of flexible curriculum that allows for, and this is not just in early years, but sort of across the piece, um, 
having the freedom to 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 do what have a more child centered approach um more sort of professional trust and autonomy to to be able to do what's right for the children in the yeah. moment rather than worrying about the sort of um implications of being highly monitored all the time in terms of data and progress um and kind of related to that is is the uh the offstead um kind of influence on practice so as well as talking about changes to the curriculum teachers talk about how offstead has um a big impact on their well-being because it it impacts lots and lots of different things about the way that schools run including workload including that kind of conflict we just talked about um so yeah pretty much all the, the teachers i've spoken to have said that they they would like to see a major reform to Ofsted, um, not you know beyond the sort of changes that have been made recently, the sort of small changes, that it needs to be in their view something much more radical. Um, and and when when you ask them, well, what would that look like? They suggest it should be based on the kind of principles that we try and apply to our practice with children. So it should be formative, supportive, pedagogical approach rather than just a summative yeah, um, judgment based unitive yeah. kind of mm. kind of thing. Um, and you know it should be they, they sort of the kind of general discourse that that's emerged from the interviews is that um you know we we want to keep getting better as teachers. We always and we are always trying to do that and we want help with that. Um, please do help us and support us and give us more resources. But we want that to be done in a more pedagogical way. That's, that's kind of like, you know, more, more of a consultancy model, I suppose, where people come in and it, and they sort of say, you know, what things do you think you're doing well? What things would you like help with? And then they provide that support and then they come back, see how you're doing. Um, and there's this sense that in their view, it doesn't need to have this high, the same sort of high stakes, punitive you know you sort of get one shot and then yeah and then that's it you have to never die by that literally. yeah and, and they talk a lot about possibility of great you know grade gradings being remo removed um yeah so that's the kind of key thing that comes out because it, around monitoring as we've talked about in some of the other episodes you know a big stress of the teachers is is kind of having to provide evidence all the time yeah um rather than just focusing on being with the children in the moment and then after school being able to focus on planning really high quality lessons instead there's a lot of um assessment and monitoring that they don't think is necessarily to be done in that that way i mean i was working again with a setting fairly recently that after in january were taking out some of their reception play-based stuff and bringing some tables in and the discussion was all around the in fact the adult was saying, I feel really uncomfortable about doing this. My sand and water tray are disappearing because I need two more tables. And I was like, well, why do you need two tables? These children have literally only been in here in reception since September. They're still really young. And she's like, to get the children to achieve the early learning goal for writing to the percentage that I am being asked to achieve, no child would ever achieve that, or very few children would achieve it under their own steam if they were given opportunities to engage in a play-based child-led learning environment. I have to begin from January doing structured, focused phonics, writing, handwriting, phonics, writing, handwriting. It's the only way I'll get them there. So then did a conference of just early years practitioners and just said, just in matter of interest, how many of you who are reception teachers think that if you didn't do really focused teaching around phonics and writing that your children would get that early learning goal and all of them said the majority of their children wouldn't achieve it because it doesn't seem to be linked to typical child development it's linked to a hot, almost hot housing focus on literacy and mathematics which are important but at the expense of all the other things where you might build. So those dispositions for learning like curiosity and resilience, those things you build through, you know, safe failure or play or social interaction. If you're spending all your time sitting on the carpet, listening to phonics and then going to do a phonic activity with a very stressed adult who knows they probably shouldn't be doing it. And then they are saying to me things like, There'll be a certain group of children, often but not always boys, who are really difficult to manage and therefore they start to kick off or they're sliding under the table or they're going to the toilet or and everything just becomes stressful. 
So every day is about how do we get these boys? Or in the afternoon, I can't do the play with them because I've got to hear my readers every afternoon. Every child has to read. So suddenly, the kind of what we're talking about in the early years foundation stage, the play-based pedagogy about how important play is, you know, to, to development beyond five, disappears because now reception are filtering that down into nursery or reception are going to their preschools who are feeder preschools and saying it'd be really good if when they came to reception in September, they could sit on the carpet, do this, do that. So the preschools feel the pressure and it's all come from policy. None of it has come from child development. If we said, let's look at how children typically develop in a really supportive environment in the best way possible, we wouldn't have a lot of those end points that we've got now at five because they're just not developmentally appropriate. But yet we do them. And that's what you're saying about practitioners who have this clash between what I believe I should be doing and what I feel obliged to do or I am judged you know, to be doing. Yeah, and just as you were talking about that, um, it reminded me of, you know, teachers talk about as well how the, the, how the use of language really... Um, can compound that stress around that conflict. So but there's a lot of use of the um, you know, strong verbs like however many percent of children must meet yeah. expected standard, must, as if it's a non-negotiable, yeah. which, as you say, all teachers want their children to make as much progress as possible. And, and there's nothing more rewarding as a teacher than, than seeing that progress and th- being like, oh, wow, that child couldn't do that yesterday. Now they can do it today. Everybody's on the same side in that regard. But this idea that if we just make up a standard of what we think everyone should have to do, we can just teach us. Everybody has to do it. And that they're all going to progress at the same rate, et cetera. And that it doesn't matter which area you're in. You can just... And it also means that make it all all right. You know, it's it's very stressful for teachers to have that pressure, isn't it? And culturally, we begin to value your ability to write and do maths, all of which are important basic skills. But we've only attaching value to children's ability to be able to write a sentence or do a number sentence, or and that feeds then into the culture of education throughout. So suddenly, you're only clever, or you're only smart, or you're only intelligent if you can present your knowledge in a particular way, as opposed to saying what we know about neurodiversity, child development, all those kind of things. There are so many different ways to be clever, um, but yet we are governed by policy and to some extent offset as a result of the policy that tend to look and value those outcomes, which is why further through the school system, the creative elements like art and design and fashion and drama and music are the first things that get chopped and replaced by other subjects like, you know, literacy, numeracy, mathematics, science. And that can't be right because as human beings, we all know that we are more holistic than that. And also this idea of, we talked about in episode one, you know, children learn best through play, but also adults flourish in playful environments. And I don't think that necessarily means you've got to be like Benny Hill running around giving people piggybacks. But the idea that if you're relaxed and you've got high level of well-being in your workspace and you've got a bit of banter with your colleague and you've got that, that not only permeates from you, so you have that kind of invisible electricity that moves out into the space, you as a practitioner are a way happier practitioner because the environment is playful. And by play, we mean you can explore, you can interpret, you've got time to pause, to breathe, to think, as opposed to like bang, 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 bang. And that's where you just get pushed further and further down. Yeah, absolutely. And there is research out there that shows, as you would expect, that the children are very, they really do pick up on the mood of the teacher, how happy they are. And the, the, the current conditions make it almost impossible to, to not be stressed, I think, as a, yeah. as a teacher. Um, and yeah, it's it's not, so you're not setting up the conditions for pupils to thrive in their well-being because you're not, you know, it isn't that atmosphere that's so important. Um, and interestingly, in terms of the different subjects that you mentioned, I, I completely agree. Like we need to be valuing children as individuals and, and valuing all the different strengths and um, doing that by by kind of making sure there's lots of opportunities to, to sort of progress in all the subjects. But 
funnily enough, one of the causes of stress in the, the sort of, uh, older primary phases is the the new focus on trying to make all subjects the same kind of level of status in like the sort of Ofsted framework, etc. Um, that's actually causing loads of stress because the, the teachers are welcoming that shift towards valuing other subjects. But the problem is if you don't take away the pressure on the the end of key stage assessments, you know, in English and maths, then what happens is people don't suddenly do less English and maths and more history. They you just feel start like singing your English. They do. Your like maths. They're, just, they're just crap. They're, people have talked about incredibly crammed timetables yeah. um, where, you know, you, you in some cases you have, you're trying to teach you know, multiple different subjects in an afternoon um, with like six year olds and their children are saying, is this history like what are we do what are we doing now you know what I mean and and that the, the teachers yeah. are feeling the same they're like and, and that thing about not being able to breathe comes up loads in the interview data so it's it's that thing about there's a lot of conflicting discourses and guidance aren't there like you say it's learn through play but make but, sure everybody yeah. gets here um all subjects are equal but, but you're, not. you're gonna yeah. get there's gonna be some really serious consequences if if they don't you know, these children don't get this in English and maths. So, and it's always teachers and, you know, school leaders as well that are in the middle of this trying to desperately find a, uh, a solution in what must feel like quite an impossible space. And that does come out. That is one of the key. It's, they, interestingly, they don't talk about the children being the cause of stress. They talk, which I, you know, I don't know whether I found that surprising or not, but it kind of just shows you um how the teachers are kind of framing how they feel not uh, they're not kind of you know I'm fed up with the children it's like I'm the the, the problem is the systems and the, and how the ch these systems are not fit for the children and that's where the stress comes but I think that's a change and if I again I'm not that old but if I go back to 1991 when I first started to teach there what I mean, maybe I've said it just started but the culture was at playtime you went and sat in the staff room you had a cup of tea at lunchtime all the staff went to the staff room and ate their lunch and we used to have the people's friend delivered to the little infant school that I worked in and they would pass the people's friend around it was that kind of and the people would knit in the staff room and you had your 45 minutes an hour nobody was at the photocopier nobody was laminating and you planned topic based stuff and yes children learned and we had schemes of work but often then, if things didn't go well, you would, the blame would be around the children and their behaviour. And I've seen a massive shift, like you're saying, that less and less it's about the children, because it never really is about the children. But it's about the fact that how am I supposed to do this? A practitioner said to me the other day, I feel like I'm fallen. She said, you know, when you have those dreams where you just feel like you're fallen, she said, that's what I feel like when I'm at work all the time, that kind of high anxiety of I just... I've got nothing to cling on to and I don't know how long I can keep that going on for. So we get that that's where a lot of people are. And again, I think a really strong message is you're not alone in that. But as we come to the end of this kind of final episode, if there are any key takeaways in terms of all the things we've talked about around how can we can build our own resilience, but also create a culture of resilience in the spaces that we work in, have we got any just key bits we could finish on that are a little bit more, more positive than my last comment yeah so I suppose at the individual level it, you know if if you're listening to this and thinking about it as an individual early years teacher um I think the key thing one of the key things to to reinforce is that it's it's natural for your resilience to kind of ebb and flow and not to panic when that happens and definitely not to blame yourself. It's one of the problems with the word resilience is it can be seen as a, can be used as a weapon if you like, of like, oh, well, you just need to be more resilient. That's absolutely not, not absolutely not how it is. Um, and instead it's about being kind to yourself. And when you do feel rubbish, which you inevitably will at times, understanding why and thinking what are the resources in my environment, including, you know, family and friends, colleagues, um, organizational resources like mentoring at your school or whatever, what resource can make you feel better? 
And then as a leader, if I was listening to this, maybe as early as phase leader, I think the key take home really is about how powerful relational resilience is. So relationships and having that kind of open conversation and trying to be really kind of sensitive as you can to how people might respond to the way you're speaking to them, the kind of demands that you're doing and just trying to really, like you said, Alistair, remember about that human side of it, that actually we're we're all overgrown children, aren't we? And actually we yes. need to be, I still need people to be really nice to me, <laughs> otherwise I will cry. <laughs> I think it's that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I think they're, they're the key, key messages really that, you know, resilience is nobody's individual responsibility, but there are lots of things in our environment that we can draw upon to help or support that. Um, and we need to build healthier environments in general in our schools, which obviously the government has a big, big role to play. Absolutely. And I think that's a really lovely place to end. It has been absolutely fascinating to talk to you about this. Literally just talked about it all day. I think the really key points around, you know, you have some responsibility for ourselves, but it's not our total responsibility. And But this stuff is really important, you know, Ultimately, you know, when you die and you've got a gravestone, nobody's going to write in your gravestone. They stayed at work till six o'clock every night. So it's about making sure that you are the best person you can be for you and your family as well as that really important job. But uh, for now, uh, until next time, Steph Ainsworth, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'd like to say a huge thank you to our guest, Steph, for joining us and providing us with such valuable information and insights. You've been listening to the TDS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Alistair Price Clegg, and Steph Ainsworth. Now, if you've been inspired by our conversation today, then don't forget you can sign up via the link in our episode notes and be the first to hear about future episodes and access exclusive follow-up content that will include ideas for your setting and links to loads of relevant resources. Thank you.